Welcome to Hold and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach, and this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? I met today's guest in a yoga training a couple of years ago, but we didn't chat much until recently thanks to social media. Fariha Begum, also known as Shuki, is an engineer, yoga guide, and food blogger. She loves to share wellness tips, not just through meditation, movement, and nutrition, but also through her experiences in improving her mental health. Shuki shares candidly about her experiences growing up in the South Asian community in Brooklyn, mental health, and overall wellness. Again, this is another conversation where we could have chatted for hours. In today's episode, Shuki shares her grandma's memory and influence on her dealing with anxiety and depression and how yoga helped her come back to herself, mental health and beauty standards in the South Asian community, toxic positivity in the wellness industry and how it's shifting, her detox from social media to make space for herself, and how we make rules to feel better but end up restricting ourselves, and so much more. Come get cozy and join our chat. So tell me a little bit more about yourself. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? So I was born and raised in Brooklyn. I spent most of my life here. And um, my parents are from Bangladesh. They came to Brooklyn about 30 years ago. And uh, we're, we're all Muslim. So that's, that's a huge part of my identity, at least that's something I consider. And growing up was, um, growing, growing up in Brooklyn was actually one of the greatest things I'm so grateful for in my life because um, I got to meet so many people of different cultures and religions. And I feel like, I just feel like that made me learn in a way that I didn't even realize I was learning. Um, so that was probably the most interesting thing for me growing up you know, in New York. That's cool. And right now you're also currently in Brooklyn. Yeah. So years ago, I I moved to Jersey um, for my first job out of college. And then like, I think in March when the pandemic started, um, I was actually going to come home anyway to be with my mom because um, her mother, so my maternal grandmother had just passed away. Um, And I wanted to spend some time with her. You know, I was really close with my maternal grandmother. So it's just, I mean, it's still hard, but when it was still fresh in, in our in my head, um, I was just, I was in, not in a very good place. So I knew I needed to be with my family. And the weekend that I came home, um, pretty much like New York City and New Jersey and like a lot of the states uh, neighboring started to shut down completely. So it was very like, you know, you have to quarantine, stay at home, work from home. So I thought I was gonna be home for a month and then, you know, this happened and yeah, I've been here ever since. Has the dynamic changed a little bit from going on your own to living with your family? Oh yeah, I mean, I've, so I've like lived by my, with my family my whole life, right? Even when I was in college, I was a commuter. I lived half an hour away, so it made no sense to dorm. Um, But like, I remember going to college and and being surrounded by people who were like from different states, you know? Um, and it was like their first time being away from their parents. And I was still like, okay, I don't know what that feels like. Cause every day I'm just like going to college didn't really feel any different in terms of school. You know, it was just right. like more work, but I'm still, <laughs> I'm still living at home. Um, so when I moved out for the first time after I graduated and I got my job, that was like such a life changing experience to like live completely by myself and be like independent. Um, so then coming back, it was a little strange because it wasn't like, like I came home and it was like all these like little nuances started coming back. Um, I definitely started reverting back to certain thought patterns and behaviors that I did even as a child. And it's something I probably wouldn't even notice unless I was like, cause I was still talking to my therapist doing phone sessions. 
and she pointed out like I would sometimes I would feel bad about certain things and I was like I haven't felt like this I don't know what's going on and she'd be like well you know you're back in the place where like you endured all your trauma so you're going to revert back to old pa patterns and I was like yeah that's so once you realize though that though it's a little easier to not revert as much right. so that's, that's something I noticed that's such an interesting point because I moved out during university, but I live with a relative and then a couple of years later I had my own place and I realized I got to just be and not worried about coexisting in somebody else's space. And mm -hmm. then when I go back to visit my family in Peru, I revert. I go back to that space, one, because that's kind of the family dynamic where, you know, the parents have their authority and you become the child again, even though you're an adult. So it's such an interesting point of how we, we kind of play different roles in our relationship and friendships and in the family. And sometimes you just go back unconsciously and you can yeah. trigger some stuff up. <laughs> you know what, we're, like, we're talking about like how it triggers us to have like, almost like negative thought patterns and behavior. Like it's it's like almost a bad thing when we go back home for us, it, it hurts, right? Yeah. Um, but you know what, there's an opposite side too though, I think. I think sometimes it's, it could be a very good thing. Like I know my father, he's from a small town near the water in Bangladesh. And um, whenever we go back as a family and like we go back to his home, like we take turns like going to my mom's hometown and his hometown. And they both do this, but I've noticed it more in my father like um and, you know most countries like when you speak a different language like even within the language there's like different accents and dialects just like we have in america you know yeah. so like my dad has the accent of the town that he's from and that accent gets amplified when we go and i'm just like what i've never heard you sound like this before. he's like he's just like sound like what i sound like how i usually talk i'm like no like no you don't um and it's it's i wonder if like i do the same thing you know like i don't notice if my accent is different when i speak english over here and when i speak english over there you know it's it's really interesting to think about that is true and i love how you brought the story of seeing your dad with his i guess his family because yeah when i go back to china and i see my parents with their friends and high school friends it's almost as if there's a different persona like i i love getting to see that part of them because with us they've always been the parent but when they're with their friends they're more playful or joking and they i i don't know i just love seeing how they are yeah i think it just goes to show that human beings aren't like in like they're not just one type of personality all the time you know like your circumstances can change who you are and how you act yeah thanks for sharing that you're welcome so you work as an engineer right now and also a yoga guide mm -hmm. tell me a little bit how did you get into those roles okay so um it's just a, a quick rundown of um, how I ended up becoming an engineer really is, is just based on the fact that uh, math and physics were always my favorite subjects, uh, academic subjects in school. And, um, you know, when you're 18, you're kind of just like, all right, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, no I never, pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I never knew, like, as a kid, I never really had the like chance to really think about all that. But um, I figured I had to make a choice. So I figured I'm going to pick something with subjects that I like. Um, and so now um, I work as a design engineer as um, I studied mechanical engineering. So that's, that's my main job. And then um, doing uh, yoga, teaching yoga classes, that's something I've been practicing yoga since I was 15 years old. Um, I used to be a Bollywood dancer in high school. I used to go to like a performing arts school. So it was a really big deal. Like if you did things like acting, singing and dancing. So dancing was my thing. And um, my teacher recommended, my dance teacher recommended we do yoga because it helps keep you flexible, which is good for, you know, dancers. And so that's why I did it. That's how I started. Um, and back then I didn't really like it because the yoga, I had one yoga teacher back then and she was very like forceful. Like she was like, oh, you know, if you want to get into a split, you have to do these stretches for 10 minutes. And it's like, uh, yeah, I did not enjoy it, but you know, when you're young, you just, you're just told what to do and you do it, you know. Um, I didn't really think about it. I just thought like, oh, I don't like it, but that's how it's supposed to be. Um, and then in college, I stopped dancing because I was, um, you know, studying engineering, everything, my whole life, just my whole lifestyle pretty much shifted from being a dancer to being a, a college student, right? So, um, yeah, so I, I kept practicing yoga 
because I figured physical, um, any kind of physical exercise is good for you, right? Because that's what you're told. Um, but then, you know, I, I changed my, I changed classes, I changed teachers, and um, I had this one teacher who was, who was really good at what she was doing, and she wasn't just like about the poses, you know? Um, and I started realizing just how much yoga calmed me down because I, I experienced a lot of anxiety and depression in, in college. I think that was the most, in my life, that was the most anxiety and depression I've ever experienced. Even, even like five years later, I can say that. Um, but yoga was one of the things. I did a lot of things to try and figure out how to deal with that stuff. But yoga was one of the things that helped me a lot. And um, I remember specifically going to a class like for three months, I didn't do any kind of movement. I didn't dance, I didn't do yoga, I didn't exercise. I was just like so stressed about school. All I did was like study and go to class, right? So um, one day I finally just, I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna go to class, go to a yoga class. And I remember like getting into child's pose and I started crying because I was like, I was like, if I just did this, like all throughout the months, I would have felt a little better. It was like, I started crying from relief. Like I was relieved. Um, and then, you know, we continued the class and I realized like, I feel really good right now, more good than I've felt like in months. And I want people to have this feeling. So that was kind of when I made, made a decision that I don't know how I was going to do it or like, what it was going to lead me towards, but like I was going to, I was going to teach yoga classes one day. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the backstory of that. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about, um, the anxiety you started to experience during the college times? Was there anything specific or just the pressure of trying to? Um, so on the surface, my anxiety really stemmed from taking exams. Um, like, I mean, I later I realized, you know, just like through my own self work and, and therapy, I realized there was much of a deeper reason as to what triggered my panic attacks. Like I pretty much had like the most intense panic attacks in my college years. Um, and it always seemed like it was stemmed from taking an exam. Um, so I was always really bad at taking tests from like elementary school all the way to SATs, just never did well on exams and it was it was weird because at some point i did start doing well in school like in like like in general like i understood what i was learning i studied but like just like ex the exams by itself um i did really poorly um and i you know i was i can remember being nervous for an exam even in elementary school but like you know when you get to college and you take an exam it's not the same like the pressure gets amplified more in college to pass because all of a sudden you're you're paying for an education and you know it's like you're older and this this is your career so it matters so i think like that made it worse like i was already bad at taking tests and then that just made it worse um but then when i started realizing like what is it about exams that that scare me um i think it comes from well, one of the one of the main things it came from was i grew up in a culture where I'm supposed to like we're all supposed to get really high grades all the time you know like if you don't get a hundred out of hundred on that exam you failed like if you get a 99 you failed like where's that other point you know what I'm talking about mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> the story of my so, life <laughs> yeah exactly so I think like like I said it seems like on the surface it's just like I have test taking anxiety but it's really just like childhood trauma of of the pressure to come from a culture where, you know, you have to be perfect. You have to have the, hold yourself to the highest standards. And, you know, we can go even deeper into that where like my parents, you know, they, they immigrated here 30 years ago. Like there's a lot of pressure when, you know, your parents kind of leave behind their whole life to give you a better one before you're even born, you know? Yeah. Um, and they'll, they'll never let you forget it. I mean, I love my parents. I almost feel like saying that makes it sound like I'm, I'm, talking behind their back or something <laughs> um, because I, I know they love me and I know they want the best for me and I know that the way they parented me was the way that they were parented probably even like more so you know so I can't even imagine what it was like for them growing up and, and going to school and having those expectations but you know like being from an immigrant family I think really introduced me to a whole new realm of of trauma and anxiety that even as a 27 year old who's, you know, I'm not in school anymore, I don't take tests. Um, and those panic attacks don't happen as often, right? Because I'm like, the test was the trigger, taking a test was a trigger, but you know, anxiety and depression has, you know, been on and off. 
after I graduated school, it's still there. And I realized like if it was really just about the test, then I, I wouldn't still have these these feelings of, of anxiety, right? So I've been, I feel like in the past few years, I've worked a lot through that trauma of, of really understanding the kind of family and culture that I come from. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty deep and intense work because you're kind of the first in your family to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm the middle child, so I have an older sister and I have a younger sister. Um, and, you know, um, you know, they have very similar experiences to me. Um, but like, yeah, we're first generation. So it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of, <laughs> of pressure, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, I saw this post yesterday where somebody shared about how first generation kids, their trauma is, you know, we have the tools, we have the privilege to work and heal our trauma because we're aware of it. There's yes. a language, mm -hmm. but we can see our parents yet. They don't have the language or the awareness and, you know, especially immigrants. Yeah. So how the hell do you, you know, you're frustrated because you want to heal, you want them to heal, but they don't even have that in their radar. And it sometimes mm -hmm. it can be so frustrating to try to kind of, you know, yeah. bring them along for the ride. You know, you know that saying, um, you know, you can only, you can like, you can't help how you feel, but you can help how you react. I think, yeah. I think that saying really works here because, you know, it's interesting that you said that like first generation kids tend to like want to do the work and want to heal. I don't know if I like completely agree with that because I've met a lot of first generation like living in New York City my whole life. Uh, most of my friends are from also like same first generation or they were born in another country really young and they came here with their parents, you know, and they have very similar childhoods like, it, you know, I'm so my family and I are Bengali, but, um, you know, I have East Asian friends and African American friends and um, Hispanic friends, you know, all these, even European friends, like all these, all these different cultures, they experience something very similar where their parents are like, you have to be like the best at what you do because we didn't come to this country for nothing. You know, that attitude is there, but like I've met, and you know, I, I've even been one of these people myself. Like when I was younger in college, like I did not think that I had to heal from trauma. I didn't realize that all this trauma has been inflicted on me, like, you know, um, unintentionally or intentionally. Like I had no idea. I just thought like, yeah, life's hard, whatever, <laughs> you know? And um, so I feel like even for first generation people, it, it takes time for them to really understand that what's happening to them is, is traumatic and that, you know, it, it, it's unfortunate, but it's extra work that you have to do for yourself so you can really live your best life. Yeah, definitely having the awareness because similar to you, me growing up, I'm like, I'm an introvert. I spend a lot of time in my head. I can deal with my own emotions. And there was a little bit of pride in this until a couple of years ago. I think that was when I first started to go to my natural path. I just wanted to balance my body. And she asked me like, your body is like very stressed. Even though you quit your job and all that, you are still reacting. Do you see a therapist? And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, I would like to, but like, do I need to like need to like yeah. what does need even mean so I started uh -huh. seeing a therapist and it's just it opened my eyes because it was able to see myself from the outside and how I dealt with things even though it worked in the past and I made it this far there's a better way to do it maybe sometimes a kinder way and then yeah. understanding that process yeah, I think, well, therapy, like, I'm glad you brought up therapy because, like, if you're comparing, like, the kind of work that first-generation kids tend to want to do in themselves and the kind of work that the parents should do but, like, don't think they need to, like, therapy is one of those things. Like, um, I mean, you can tell me your experience growing up, but, like, even now, like, I go to therapy and I'll tell my parents, like, yeah, I go to therapy and they're like, why? You're not, like, mentally ill. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I get like, you, you know, you don't have I to have, like, you. severe mental illness to go to therapy you know? Um, and so I think, I think my parents and a lot of like, um, people, especially like the older generation of my culture, they, they tend to think mental health isn't taken very seriously. Um, so going to therapy is like frowned upon, like something's really wrong with you. If you go to therapy and I'm like, well, no, something's really right for you because you're helping yourself. You know, it's, it's a very strange thing to look down on, I think, from, from a cultural standpoint. Like I never, even growing up, 
if I ever heard someone was going to therapy, like before I really understood what therapy was, um, I always thought like, what's like, what's this taboo with therapy? Why do people care if someone's going to go and talk about their feelings? They want to talk about their feelings to them, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but yeah, my parents, I mean, I think they've softened up over the years. I think in the beginning, they were very like, they were like almost concerned, like, why are you going to therapy? What's wrong? You know? Yeah. But now they're kind of like, oh, you're still going to therapy? Okay, well, if it's helping you, I guess, you know? <laughs> So like, I'm hoping in the, in the next few years, they'll be like, oh my God, you're going to therapy and you just seem like you're doing so much better. Maybe I should go to therapy. I'm hoping that's what will happen. Yes. In a way, <laughs> if we really want to heal that generational trauma, we have to heal and show them it's possible. And if they mm -hmm. see it, that's the only way, by showing. Yeah, you know, I, so I think, honestly, I think I'm, I'm getting there with my parents when it comes to like this, this desire for them to want to work on themselves. Like I want them to work on themselves, but I can't force them. They have to want, they have to truly want to, right? Um, so they're getting there, I think. It's nice, but I think um, I've actually like, I talk about my therapy sessions and I've been seeing this one therapist for the past almost like, I don't even know, four years, I think. Yeah, it's a long time. Um, and she, you know, she knows really well. She's really, really good at her job. Um, I admire her a lot and, uh, She's helped me grow so, so much. Um, and I always like talk about her and my sessions with my friends, um, especially my friends who I know are interested in therapy. Like they want to work on themselves, but they're also not ready. You know what I mean? They're not ready to take that step and call a therapist and be like, hey, I want to I wanna work on myself. Um, but like I've, I've talked, I think I've like have maybe three or four different friends who like, they're like, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to start going to therapy. I'm like, really? I'm so glad. <laughs> So yeah, it's like the more you, it's not just talking my experience, but actually like living the things that you're learning, you know, like how to be better to yourself and better to the world. Like when you, when you do those things, people are going to notice whether you talk about actually like actual therapy or not. And I, I hope that happens with our parents. Yeah, I love that. And I love how you show that when you work on yourself, it, it shows like you don't have to preach it to anyone. It just mm -hmm. shows. Yeah. Exactly. What, what do you think are some of the common misconceptions in for therapy? Maybe in the South Asian community or in general? Um, okay, well, in, in the South Asian community, like I said, um, people do tend to think that you have to be severely mentally ill um, to go to therapy. And even the term, like, even that term severely mentally ill can be a different definition. There's no like, I, I feel like you can't really look that up in the dictionary and know, like, everybody's not going to have the same idea of what the definition is. Yeah, um, yeah I think, like, I think um, people also tend to think that, like, you have to have, like, really, really severe trauma. And, you know, what's severe to one person may not be severe to the other person. You never, you never know what somebody is going through. Um, I think um, people tend to, like, I actually had this one friend years ago who, I told him that um, I have a lot of like self-esteem issues. I'm not very confident. Um, I have a, I'm pretty sure I have imposter syndrome, which <laughs> I've learned not to self-diagnose myself, even with terms like that, because it's like, um, you know, it's like when you put a label on yourself, all of a sudden it's like even, it's like even more true, you know? Um, but I was telling him all these things and he was like, I, like, I had no idea that you ever felt that way about yourself. Cause just like looking at you, like knowing you as my friend who, you know, does the kind of job that she does and, and has the kind of personality that she has, like, I would never think that you had those issues because, you know, you're so smart and you're good at everything that you do. And I'm like, yeah. in your, I mean, thank you. But in your eyes, that's, that's what you're seeing. But like, nobody's really going to understand like how, how unconfident I feel in myself when it comes to doing anything, you know? Um, so going to therapy has given me that confidence. So now I think like, you know, if I'm doing, if I'm working on a project, um, at work or, you know, if I'm guiding a yoga class or if, you know, I have a food blog and I make a lot of different recipes, I think even like, I look back at my, like really, uh, my first recipes ever. And I look at the more recent ones and I realize like, I can see my own confidence building even in something like that you know yeah. and that wouldn't have happened if i if i didn't go to therapy and, and and work through all that so circling back to your question about the misconceptions is that like like you know i'm not what most people in my culture would think is severely mentally ill and so they think that like 
I'm kind of wasting my time by going to therapy because there's nothing quote unquote wrong with me. But, you know, I do all these things that are, you know, pretty normal. You know, I'm an engineer, I have a food blog, whatever, all that stuff. Like, because I went to therapy, I have more confidence to do all those things better, you know, and that's, that's a big deal. Yeah. Thank you for sharing the point about you looking okay from the outside and happy because I think one of the most common misconceptions I've noticed is that people assume happy people or people that are able to experience happiness cannot experience sadness or anxiety or depression or any of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so important. That's why, you know, messages about checking in with your friends and all of that, because you can't really tell. We're really good at putting up a facade or maybe we're the way I was conditioned. You don't share your vulnerability. You don't share your sadness. One, nobody can solve it for you. So you suck it up and you keep on going. And I think a lot of people in society have been operating this way, thinking, you know, this wasn't stressful. This wasn't bad. And they keep pretending, even though they might not be feeling that good themselves and they're not aware of it because they convinced themselves out of it <laughs> yeah yeah i mean we live in a world of um social media takeover um constantly looking at um perfected images of people and so i think it's really easy for someone to not even know someone you know like you can know a friend really well and still not really know just how bad things are in their head and, and just personally what's going on in your life you know um you could or you, like you could know you have more of a chance of knowing than a stranger but that's just it like you still might not know um so like you look at that and then you look at like you know, if you have social media, there's probably at least like one person you follow that you've never met in real life. And you might just think that their life is so perfect, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really not. And it's as much as I say, it, even I have a hard time like understanding and believing that like nobody is perfect and everybody goes through something, you know, whether it's childhood trauma from being growing up in an immigrant family or, you know, experiencing a death, um, of someone close and grieving you know those are all very very real things that like it doesn't show up on images and social media as much as as the good stuff yeah and it's important because we do experience everything the good the bad and the grieving but it's maybe it's i think i see a lot of people being uncomfortable with those emotions because they've never made space for it so they just bury it or ignore it. That's that's how I was. I'm like, I'm a positive person. And then my therapist like, there's nothing wrong with grieving. There's nothing wrong with that. You can feel it. But then I'm like, I don't know how to stop myself from spiraling. Like, how do I make sure that that feeling doesn't take over? Because sometimes I'm so anxious. And she's like, well, there's different ways. And a therapist is a really good person to hold space for you to help you with that feeling when you're not able to. Yeah, exactly. I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that, um, that like you used to kind of have this idea that being like being positive means that like nothing's wrong, but yeah, I mean, toxic positivity, oh, you know, yeah. I'm glad whoever came up with that term in the recent years, I'm really <laughs> glad because I never could put my finger on what I wanted, like what it was, what that phenomenon was when people were like, oh, you're sad, just be positive. It'll make you feel better. I'm like, no pretty sure being sad will make me feel better like later but you know <laughs> yeah yeah I want to talk more about it toxic positivity even in the I guess wellness yoga community sometimes we see a bit of that going on yeah well you know it's something I appreciate about 2020 because 2020 is just probably the worst year for everybody <laughs> you know yeah. or for most people I would say <laughs> I think I think something that's the one good thing that came from it is that I've and, you know, of course, like, you're going to see things from people you surround yourself with, whether it's real life or social media or both. Um, so it could be that I'm seeing this more because I've, over the years, I've learned to tailor my, you know, my Instagram feed and my friends and my social life to things that I know are going to help me grow and make me feel good, you know. Um, I've seen a lot of people, like, admit how much grief and guilt they've had this year over everything that's going on in their life. I've seen a lot of people um, talking about how if they they feel shitty, but it doesn't matter because like they're just gonna they're gonna keep feeling that way and they're gonna work through it instead of burying their feelings. I've seen a lot of that, um, 
in real life and social media. So that's something that made me feel like, I think there's a shift happening in the wellness world where it used to be very, oh, be positive all the time, even if something bad's going on, because being positive is the solution to everything. Um, I think we went from that to, okay, let's feel our feelings and figure out why we're feeling what we're feeling and just let it out, you know? Yeah. I, yeah, I am seeing more of a shift, but there are still moments where I think I'm more aware of it because sometimes when you when you get to the other side where you're like, oh, you know, I can just shift my perspective, everything feels better, I do yoga. But then when you get into sort of blocks where you're like, I've done all the yoga and I still feel like crap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. And sometimes the dialogue can sound like, well, then you're not doing something right. And I, I'm starting to see the narrative changing with like, it's okay with not feeling okay. It's okay if you're feeling stressed, even though you have yeah. tools, but sometimes there's the no more, yeah, there's no more stigma or shame, right? Like, well, there is, but there's less stigma and shame for like healthy people. Like you ever, you also guide yoga classes, right? So you ever get people like, you're like, visibly anxious or angry and people are like aren't you a yoga teacher why do you <laughs> like shouldn't you be at peace like all the time and they're like no <laughs> I'm, I'm human, human. <laughs> right it's like just because just because you teach yoga or do anything in the wellness world it doesn't mean that your life is perfect and you're always going to be happy you know things happen you know yeah. um so i think there's less like there's less of that shaming go around i think shaming going around now that um more people are shifting their their views from you know toxic positivity to you know i don't know what the word that for the opposite of that would be <laughs> the reason makes me one up i guess just embracing the human experience <laughs> not yeah. very good with terms but <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um so now that you have a bit more tools dealing with anxiety and depression what did you learn about it see well I think the biggest thing I learned is that anxiety and depression are, in fact, two different things. Um, and you know that because they're, they're, you know, they're obviously separate terms with separate, separate definitions, but I think people often um, assume that they're similar and they're the same thing. Um, I would say that, that they're very different, but they relate to one another, whereas like in such a way where it's like, if you have anxiety, it's, it might lead to depression and vice versa. So like in college, when I experienced my my most heightened anxiety and depression um it was very easy for me to distinguish um at what moment i was having a panic attack at what moment i was anxious and at what moment i was depressed because um anxiety looks different on people and when i was in college the way it looked on me was um i was very high functioning i took um the max amount of credits that i was allowed to take every semester i was one of those um, and I'm not proud of it because it burned me out. Um, but I felt like if I, like, I loved, I mean, I love numbers, but sometimes it's a bad thing how much I love numbers because I think the maximum number of credits when I was in college, it was like, you're allowed to take like 21 credits or something or whatever it was. Right. And, um, I remember thinking like, if I, I would look at my, 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 uh, program every semester and I was like, if I saw that number 21, I'd get like this like feeling of happiness that wasn't like I look back now and I'm real like that wasn't real happiness that was just I don't know what that was <laughs> um but it was scary it's scary to think that like seeing that number 21 made me happy because I would you know I, I mean I graduated so I was able to like do all like take all those classes but like at what cost you know what did it really do for me besides like give me a quote-unquote boost on my on my transcript I think um, I was just really obsessed with being an overachiever and, and doing the best in every single thing that I, I set my mind to. Um, and at the time it was too much. So that's, that's kind of what my anxiety looked like. I was, I was always like, I think that's why a lot of people didn't realize that I could be anxious because they're like, you know, you do all these things. How can you be, how could you be anxious? Like, how could you be doing them and be, and be anxious? And I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> it's common. And then with depression, um, I knew I was depressed whenever, it's actually something my dad pointed out to me, like um, whenever I'd come home, um, so I'm, I'm very tall and um, I like to think that I have really, really good posture. <laughs> so <laughs> Better than well, me, I'm always hunching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, you know, in this day and age, I feel like most people are, you know, we're all on our computers no matter what kind of job we have, but 
um, I would come home and my dad would notice that I was, I was hunching when I was walking around the house or whatever. And he said, you know, you never walk like that. You're, you're like, always like, you're naturally very tall and you just have this presence where you're always like, you know, extended. And these past few months you've been, this was like my first semester, like you've been walking around with the hunchback. And like, that's when I realized like, yeah, something, something's wrong. Like I'm not feeling good most of the time, if ever. Um, and yeah, I was just, I was just like really, really sad. And um, it's funny because my anxiety made me feel like I had a lot of motivation, you know, like I took all these classes, I had like three different jobs and, and all these things. And I was like, I thought like, oh, I'm so, I'm like really motivated, it's good. But then like, I would get depressed and I was like, oh my God, I have three different jobs and like five different classes in one semester. What am I doing? You know, so um, yeah, they were very different, but they, they coexisted with each other um, very frequently. Mm, that is so fascinating. I've never seen anxiety manifesting as motivation because I can relate to, definitely relate to taking more courses than I should have to the point of burnout during university and the way it manifested for me was through physical illness. And I feel like my body, I'm learning to trust it a lot more just because if I don't, I get I end up <laughs> in the doctor's office quite often. And I grew up with the story that, you know, you're a sick kid, you're weak. So it's something that I'm learning. It's not true. It's just that I'm not listening to my body. And I was high functioning. I added like a minor towards the end while I was still working. And then, you know, I graduated, I excelled and I was so proud and I had to take a year off because I was so burnt out. And I'm like, I do not want to do anything. I just want to maybe make some money and not think. And then mm -hmm. later on, my anxiety manifested in, I guess, through insomnia and being able to sleep. But I was so high functioning. I got everything done. And mm -hmm. sometimes you get the satisfaction. Oh, it's done. But then for me, I wasn't able to rest because mm -hmm. it carried through my burnout. And even after burnout, when I quit my job, move away from environment, I still couldn't shut that down because I thought it was motivation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it um, kind of relates to what you were saying uh, in our other conversation about like when you're um, taking a break and like you're truly doing nothing and then you get like this kind of spark in your head where um, you want to do something that's either like productive or creative or both and you're thinking um, am I getting a spark right now to do it or am I just like am I just doing it because I'm high functioning I feel like I have to right um, yeah. so I think the healing process when you're healing from trauma and, and bad habits, um, it's it's not linear, right? You go back and forth a lot. You wonder whether or not you truly healed from one experience, you know? Um, yeah, so I, I think that, that very much, what you just said very much relates to that is like, you don't know if, if you're doing it because you truly want to or because you think you have to. Yeah, and the law need linear part I can't say the word linear <laughs> the long linear because I feel like you know your brain gets it gets that we have to slow down that we need to stop pushing ourselves but then when we're faced with the actual circumstances maybe you take an extra couple of rounds to fully heal or maybe we don't heal until it's just part of our life we just heal a little bit more every time mm -hmm. yeah exactly how was the healing process for you during your burnout? Was there? Um, so it's hard to say because I think I think I'm still working through like a bulk, the bulk of it. Um, it's hard to tell like when I'm going to be fully healed because, um, <laughs> you know, you can't put a like a timeline on things like that. But I would say like when I got my first job and I moved out, um, you know, just like how going from high school to college was a drastic change, like it is for most people, you know, um, college classes and high school classes are miles apart, but um, just my whole lifestyle change, right? Like I was, you know, every day I was dancing in high school. Um, and then in college, every day I was like in the library. So, you know, it's very different. And then after I graduated college and I, um, you know, I got my own apartment, um, you know, every day I was at work, um, and, you know, my job was interesting in such a way that, like, there were times where I wasn't, like, doing, I, I wish I was doing more, and then there were times where, like, I was working overtime, like, you know, 60, 70 hours a week, you know, just, it was, like, a weird ebb and flow, and um, I would think that 
I think I, I didn't like, so I went to therapy in, in college. Um, that was like my first time ever going. And then I like, I think for a year after I graduated, I stopped just cause you know, I, I went to a new place and everything. And then I realized like, I was still, I was unhappy. Like I genuinely thought that when I moved out of my parents' house that I'd be happier. And I was, it's not like it didn't bring me any happiness at all. I love, I love living by myself. Um, it's been a lifelong dream of mine. <laughs> As you can imagine, when you grow up in a house with like four other people all the time. Um, <laughs> but then I realized like it wasn't enough. Like that wasn't the only thing that was contributing to my anxiety and depression in college. My family, there were other things going on. And so I started going therapy again. And even like when I first started going to therapy, like, you know how you just said you went to your naturopath and she suggested you went to therapy and you said, um, like, do I really need to? Like, I remember going into my therapist's office and telling her, do I really need to be here? <laughs> like, I can't even, I'm just like, this was like four years ago I did that. And I, I, clearly I was a very different person back then. And I can't even imagine what my therapist might have been, must have been thinking. Like, can you imagine how much I offended her by saying that? Like, I chose to go in there, hire her for my first session. And then I'm like, do I really need to be here? Are you really going to help me? And she just looked at me like... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how she kept such good composure. It's why I admire her so much. She was like, you know, why don't you try? And she, she just said it in the nicest way. And like, I think, I think back to it now. I'm like, wow, I was being such a little brat. <laughs> like, and she was being so like nice to me. She's like, yeah, you know, why don't you try it and see how it feels, you know? And, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but I, I think it's going to work. And I was like, I'm like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I left so skeptical. Um, and I think, I think that's, that skepticalness is what kept me from going through that healing process sooner, you know? So like I said, you know, with our parents, like they, they have to want to do the work. And so like, I was in this weird limbo where like, I knew I needed to do work, but I, I, I wasn't sure just how much I wanted to heal. Um, and I think my therapist was really good at um, kind of setting boundaries for me. Like she knew when to be gentle and she also knew when to be like straight with me. Like she knew exactly, she would tell me exactly what to do so I could like get out of whatever situation I was in. I was in and there were other times where she'd kind of slowly lead me to that path. And so I think my healing process, that's, that's a big change I've recognized is that um, I'm not, I don't have to heal like I think I expected to go to therapy and think like, okay, if I go to therapy, it was like a mathematical formula, you know, it's like, if I go to therapy every week for a month, I'll feel better. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm, you know, I think like today I, I'm, I feel like I'm in such a good mood. I think I was really looking forward to talking to you. So I feel really happy right now. Um, but you know, like next week something might happen and it might be the complete opposite. And I've been going to therapy for, I've been seeing this therapist for four years and it's, it's so, it's been so up and down. Like, I can't tell you that, like I said, the healing process isn't linear, but I do think that all the work, like the happiness that I feel today and the, and the days I feel this kind of, I'm in this kind of good mood, it is contributed to the fact that I, I did that work starting four years ago you know even if i walked in skeptical yeah and not resisting which is easier said than done oh yeah no i resisted like my therapist <laughs> oh my god god bless her she tries she tries so hard with me you know um and i think i hope that i made her job a little easier by by letting myself open up to her open up to myself admit to myself how I was really feeling, you know, because I think like me and you were have both been talking about this the whole time. It's really easy to just like bury your feelings and think, yeah, everything's okay. I don't need to see a therapist. I don't need to heal. Um, you know, my trauma wasn't as bad as, as this person. So I, I must be okay. You know? Yeah. You just, you yeah. seem like you just had an aha moment. You want to Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes, at least for me, one of the times when I tried to reason my stress my anxiety you can compare to others like oh at least I didn't have a breakdown at least and all that it doesn't mean that what you're going through is not bad it's still pretty crappy and I I also see a lot of my friends during during COVID they're like well I have a job and all that I shouldn't complain I'm like no please rent because you can have a job and 
things can still be pretty crappy for you because you can't see any friends and maybe you have a kid and you don't know how to balance that because no one else can you know give you a breather because you're with your kid who's crying all the time so I'm like all these things like your circumstance is enough for you to feel whatever way you feel you don't have to justify it Mm -hmm. with other people but we do it so much (laughs) yeah I think I think there's a middle ground when it comes to having gratitude and also admitting that you're not feeling good you know Um, like I I actually um so I love I love the idea of journaling but I don't think I ever journaled as much as I did in 2020 (laughs) because like you're home so and your book is there so I think for me it was um being at home really helped me journal every day whereas before it was just like a once in a while like it's something I'd like to do you know Mm. yeah we all have those um but yeah no I think and I think I'm I I hope I carry this habit with me um even when things go somewhat back to normal which um I say somewhat because things are never going to be the same I hope people understand that um but yeah like I have this um prompt I do every morning where I have I write three things I'm grateful for and it helps me a lot um it helps me feel better it helps me set a really good like groundwork for the day to do it in the morning it's just something that really works for me um but i have days where i wake up and i feel so like upset about the state of the world what's happening in my life whether it was something really specific that happened you know recently you know like i i grieve my grandmother's death i mean i still am but i was grieving it so much like in the beginning of the year and um you know there were times where like I, I wouldn't think about the grief and then it would just come up. And so like, if that grief came up really heavily, it would be really hard for me to write that gratitude list. So I just, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't force it, you know? Mm-hmm. Like if I wake up and I'm like, I'm really sad today because I'm thinking about my grandmother or I'm really sad because I'm thinking about this or I'm angry because of this. I don't force myself to write the list. So I think for me, that's the middle ground is like most of the time I can get myself to write the list and it makes me feel better. But the few times I don't feel like writing the list I'm not going to, I'm not going to feel guilty about some prompt that I literally made up, you know, yes. like people make up these rules. They're like, okay, I have to drink lemon water in the morning. I have to do yoga for like 30 minutes and then I have to journal and my life is going to be good. It's like, yeah, those can help you, but don't set such, such, such like high expectations. You know, no one thing is going to make you feel like, you know, perfect. Yeah. And being open to adapt. Like, yeah, if you don't feel like it, doesn't mean you have to do it like don't force yourself to do things and like you said we set up silly rules to feel better but we can end up stressing ourselves trying to get to that feel good point yeah I mean I hate to admit it but I'm like the queen of rules something like (laughs) something else my therapist has has pointed out to me a lot it's like I'm telling her like how I feel guilty about this thing that I didn't do and she's like yeah it sounds like a rule such a beautiful reflection though like a gentle reflection yeah exactly so I mean I've I've had moments this year where I'm like I'm I'm really angry that I can't go outside and 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 I see people going outside and I'm angry about that and all these like anger feelings you know and then I'm like yeah but you know what I have a job like I didn't lose my job I'm so and I am I'm so lucky that I I get to work from home and I didn't lose my job because I do know people who lost their job and it's it's very hard um and I don't I don't know what that feels like you know and so yeah. I am grateful, but it doesn't mean that I'm not allowed to be angry and sad and negative about, about other things going on in my life. Beautifully put. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, you've shared on your blog and on some posts, some of the beauty standards you had growing up in a South Asian yeah, community. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you want to dive a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. Um, so... I, you know, um, like I said, my parents are from Bangladesh. Um, I have very dark skin and, um, growing up, that was, that was really hard. I think, I don't know. I don't know what my life would have been like if I was born. So interestingly enough, my, my mother is very fair, fair as they call it. She's very light skin and my father is dark skin. So I, I look more like my dad. And um, I think growing up with, even though they're from the same country and, you know, same culture, um, I think growing up with, with parents who essentially looked opposite of each other made me even more confused as to why I got so much shit for having dark skin. Um, so I had a lot of Bengali female friends growing up. 
Uh, I'm not really close with them anymore for multiple reasons, but one of the main things that really made myself distance, really made me distance myself from them was um, how much they, they made fun of me for my dark skin. And um, I think it's, it's still trauma that I'm working through. And, um, you know, I, you know, some of the, I, I had like, I don't even know how many, there were quite a few girls in my class, Bengali girls in my class. And um, a couple of them, I think one of them may have been dark skinned like me, but most of them were very, very light skinned or fair as uh, Asian culture likes to put it, right? Um, and I, you know, this is something in the past few years that I had to come to terms with that, you know, what they did was wrong, but we were all children. You know, they were young children who were, children tend to do things that they're taught, you know? So someone, meaning the older people in our culture, the older generation has taught us that dark skin is ugly. And if you have dark skin, you're not as worthy for something as a light skinned person is. And unfortunately, it's not just true in South Asian culture. It's, it's true in pretty much every single culture out there, um, especially like talking to so many people from different cultures. Like I've heard this story everywhere and it's very, very it's very, very unfortunate. So recently I had to come to terms with the fact that even though they made fun of me, it's like, at some point when we were really young, they didn't really understand what they were doing. Like they didn't understand just like how wrong it was. So that kind of helps me forgive them on some level, you know, that like we were kids and they didn't know any better. Um, I can't, I mean, like, I know even if I was targeted for my dark skin, I can't imagine that I was the perfect child who, you know, never did anything wrong. So I look at it from that perspective and I realize like, you know, them making fun of my dark skin, it really hurt me and that's something I have to work through now, but I don't have to hold on to that anger for the rest of my life. I, it, it is possible to let it go. Um, and that's something I've, I've worked on a lot in the past couple of years. I'm so sorry you went through that, but thank yeah. you for sharing. Yeah, that. thank you. Yeah. Mm. Are the beauty standards the same for men? In yeah, actually, yeah, I would say, I mean, yes and no. Uh, when it comes to dark skin, so like arranged marriages are a huge thing in South Asian culture. Um, and I've definitely like heard people say, like, if they're going to a professional matchmaker um, to, to look for a husband or a wife, if a parent of a daughter is going to a matchmaker, they will say like, okay, we want our son-in-law to be fair. Um, we want him to be smart. We want him to have a job. We want him to have a master's degree. I don't know. There's all these like weird standards, but like one of them is usually fair. And I think, and you know, the thing is I'm a woman. So obviously I have some bias when I say this, I do think that the beauty standards are, are the beauty standards are harsher for women. Um, and I, I realized that I could be more biased, but like, I don't know. I'm pretty sure it's true. I'm pretty sure women do have it harder, especially when it comes to skin color, because at the end of the day, we live in a patriarchal, is that a word? Patriarchal? Patriarchal? <laughs> yeah, we live, okay, we live in a society where women have less privilege. So why wouldn't women have less privilege when it comes to the topic of dark skin, you know? Um, so I've definitely seen men in my culture um, experience similar things to me, and it's it's very unfortunate that we you know that we both have to experience it. But um, yeah, no, I think women like there are higher expectations of women, especially now because like my grandma, she always used to talk about how you know like she got she was kind of like forced into getting married at like sixteen, and um, you know she had to stop going to school, you know. And like, it's so unfortunate because I think, I think she, I could kind of tell like she has some, she had some kind of regret about that whenever she, whenever she talked about her life in the past. Um, and I, and now it's like, I think things are changing for the better. Um, you know, more women are expected to go to school and get a degree and get a job and all that. So like slowly we're gaining all the privileges that we should have had access to in the first place, like back in my grandma's day, right? But the, the double-edged sword of that is that, okay, so like you, 
we expect you to get an education and a degree and a job, but you still have to also be a mom and, and you have to get married. You have to get married at this age and you have to have this many kids and you have to do it all, you know? It and adds I think on to women, our existing pile. Yeah, and I think, I think if a woman wants to do all that, like if she truly wants to have a career and a family, that like, yeah, of course, that's, that's an amazing thing. But when someone who thinks they have some authority over you tells you like you have to do all that or you're not worth anything. Like if you just get married, then shame on you. If you just have a career and you never become a mom, also shame on you. It's like, it's like let, let women figure out if they want to do one or the other or both, you know? Um, so I've definitely seen that come into, especially now that I'm older and I'm getting the comments of, so when are you getting married? Aren't you like 50 now? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, like I think I'm so I'm 27 and in the past couple of years it's like, wow, when are you getting married? You're getting like you're getting really old. And I'm like, oh my God, am I? Oh, it's so scary. It you know? makes it sound like we have an expiry date. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm like I didn't realize I was a carton of milk. Thank you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. Some of the other standards that I think you share was being um tall. <laughs> oh yeah and skinny those so, are also okay. things well, that are i would say this the my skin color was probably the hardest thing i could deal with in, sort of, in terms of physical appearance but like i've noticed that um uh, my height and just how skinny i am like those two things came into play a lot so i'll start with the height thing uh <laughs> i honestly like you know growing up i loved being tall like i never had a problem with being tall okay tall people have so many advantages in life Okay. Yeah, <laughs> like, all by myself. You know, it's great. Like, I and it's something I loved about myself. It's like the one thing I think I really, really liked about myself because you're constantly told that your dark skin is ugly. You're gonna start to start like you're gonna start to hate your own dark skin. You know, and of course now I've like, I now I've um, learned to love my dark skin and and you know it's it's such a nice feeling. I wish I had that feeling my whole life. But with 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 my height, I've never. I was like, I love being tall. But then there was this like one time. So uh, when I was 17, I've, so I've been my, like, I'm about like five, nine, maybe five, eight and a half. I've been that height since I was 14. And so, yeah, I was like, I was a really tall kid in middle school. I'm so school. jelly. I wish I was that tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's, and so like when I was 17, uh, my family and I went to Bangladesh together and I had a, my mom, like we went to this, like we went to my mom's village where she grew up and, you know, it's very like kind of a old school um countryside village and um we were at this marketplace and this is a really small town so she ran into a friend that she had from like her equivalent of middle school i think so um they just like literally just recognized each other on the street you know and they're like oh my god i haven't seen you in years and my mom was like yeah well i live in america now and she's like oh my god you know and so she she so my mom invites her childhood friend to our house and she introduces like um me and my sisters you know all three of us like one by one and when it was my turn like she saw my sisters and you know they 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 had their greetings or whatever and she sees me and like instead of greeting me the first thing she says she's like oh my god your daughter is so tall like aren't how are you going to get her married like it was so bizarre i mean like i've gotten like growing up in bengali culture i know how important it is for a woman to get married but like i've never experienced that until that moment i was like wait like, why are you so worried about my height and when I'm gonna, it was so strange. I was like, and she genuinely seems like stressed about it. Like she wasn't making a joke. That was the weird part, you know? And my mom, I think, I think my mom, my mom's shorter than me. She's like five, six, but even that like is considered tall in, in Bangladesh because we are a pretty short group of people. <laughs> <laughs> but my mom, like who everybody also like, you know, said she was like really tall and everything. Like, I think she kind of, expected that you know because my mom might have gotten those comments too when she was growing up um i mean she married my dad my dad's like an inch taller than her so i don't i mean it worked out right <laughs> yeah <laughs> like my mom was just my mom just said like oh you know i'm not worried about that because you know height's not like it's not a big deal right and i just i remember just thinking like even my height is equated down to how am i going to get married you know so as much as I, I loved being tall in that moment, I very much felt like it doesn't matter what I look like. It doesn't matter if, I, if I'm ugly or beautiful. Like someone is gonna find something to say about me getting married, even, even at a young age of like 17, 
you know? And that, I mean, that woman probably didn't know any better, you know? So I can't, I can't be too angry at her, but in the moment it was just, it did not feel good. Yeah. Um, the other thing was, um, yeah. So being skinny, um, yeah, I got a lot of, you know, um, don't you eat anything or, you know, you should eat more because like, how are you going to bear children? Oh my God. So it's like, <laughs> we were just having this conversation about getting married. And so, yeah. okay, so I think I can't bear children because I'm too skinny. Oh my uh, gosh. Yeah. And you know, I think, I think growing up in a country like America, I know, I know how much privilege um, comes with having a thin body because people tend to idealize thin bodies. Right. Um, so it was, it was very confusing because uh, there were times where I felt like I was, I got a lot of compliments for being skinny. And then there were times I felt like I got a lot of like shit for, for being skinny. Like, you know, I think the biggest, the biggest thing I, the most, the comment I heard the most was like, how are you going to bear children? And I heard that comment when I was like, in elementary school. Oh my like, God. Other Bengali people. Yeah. From other Bengali people in my, in my community. Like, how, how's your daughter going to have children? I'm like, can you worry about that when I'm trying to get pregnant in, I don't know, 20 years? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So that's, yeah, I think all the, all the comments about, at least for me, the way I see it, all the comments that I got about my appearance very much equated to the idea that you're a woman and you're expected to do X, Y, and Z. And if you don't follow this woman, this, if you don't follow this formula, <laughs> you are not worthy. Which is a lot of, well, I don't want to generalize, but even coming from Chinese culture, I see a lot of those comments and it seems like it's the only thing they know because that's what they were raised on, you know, getting a husband and then, you know, bearing children and that's what your life is. And it's obviously a projection. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt or it's annoying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think my parents, um, in, in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm lucky that I've had my parents because they, they pretty much, um, I mean, as much as they pressured me to do well in school and my career, um, they've also like gave, like, let me prioritize my education. Like I'm, I'm really grateful that I did grow up in a country where I wasn't forced to get married at 16, like, like my grandmother was. My mother got married when she was, I think she was 23. So even though that's young, like I remember like my grandma, like even like a year ago when I was talking to her, she would always tell me how like my mom got married really old. It's like, what? She was, she was 23. Like that's so young. And she's like, no, oh my God, that's like so old because you know, people usually get married when they're in their like early teens, even, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. And you know, it's actually something my grandma, like she was really like proud of the fact that, that one of her daughters got married so late, quote unquote because she was so happy that like my mom, you know, got the chance to finish um, her education completely. She didn't have to drop out of school to get married or anything like that. Um, I think my grandma really appreciated um, that her kids and her grandkids got the privilege of to do things that she never got the chance to do. Um, and it's one of the reasons I was so close to her. She made me understand, um, you know, how privileged I, I am, how lucky I am to live the kind of life that I live. And um, she never let me forget it, but not in a, oh, be grateful for what you have kind of way. You know, it was not in a toxic positivity kind of way. <laughs> not to circle back to that part, but she was just very like, she was always so proud of me for everything, every little thing I did, you know, she was like, like when I first got my apartment, I was living by myself. She's like, you, you live in a house all by yourself? I'm like, I'm like, I rent an apartment. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's not that kind of milestone but she's like yeah but you're, you're by yourself and you're so independent you drive your own car you have your own job like she was just so like in awe of everything I did and like those are the things that like I I was very neutral about like when I got my apartment when I got my first job I wasn't like proud of myself I was like yeah I just did what I was supposed to do you know I went to college I got a job you now I live by myself right isn't that what everyone does and um when she gave me those compliments I remember thinking like She's, she's the one person in my life that um, validated me when I needed it the most, when I couldn't do it for myself, you know? Um, if I ever did something that was worthy of being proud over, even today, like sometimes I'll do something really great and I'm like, yeah, whatever, I did it. So it must have not been that great. It's like very negative way to talk to yourself. And uh, I will say I do it less now, but my grandma was, was, was the one who, who helped me realize that it doesn't have to be that way. You know, so um, 
clearly, you know, you can tell I, I miss her a lot. Yeah, but what a beautiful legacy she's left you in celebrating these seemingly, you know, tiny accomplishments in your eyes, but really appreciating you did it. And I think sometimes we're so, you know, off to the next goal, so goal focused that we don't really celebrate the achievements. And I love how, you know, you getting your own place, you graduating college, you getting doing something that seems minor. She celebrated you for that. We, we need to do more of that in our everyday lives. Yeah, yeah. I think um, ever since she passed away in January, I think I've I've been trying to do exactly what you just said is is celebrate my life a little bit more. And it doesn't mean I have to do it every day or force it because, you know, 2020 is 2020. <laughs> but yeah, no, she I mean, yeah, I don't I don't really know what my life would be like if I if I haven't met her. Um, you know, she she lived in Bangladesh most of her life. She came to the States for a little while. So like I can count on my hands how many times I've actually like seen her in person, you know, mm -hmm. but she's like profoundly probably the closest relationship I've ever had in my life. What a beautiful connection. No, oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing about her. I can feel your love and appreciation for her. Yeah. Um, oh, also one of the things that if you've been doing is a social media detox. How is that going? Oh my God, it's going so well. I don't want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> how long has it been? <laughs> um, how long has it been? I think it's like, I do these detoxes like kind of, like, I don't have a set schedule. I'm not like, okay, I'm going to detox now. It's just like when I feel like it. And I think this one started about a week and a half ago. Um, I've been really, really busy um, at work, more busy than I usually am. So um, I think that was like what made me want to do it in the first place because my to-do lists were like um, all for work. You know, and then I realized like I don't really want to make the room for anything else besides my job right now because this is what I want to work on. And before, like, so the way I use social media, like I have a website and um, I, I create content like recipes and, and yoga tutorials and things like that. And um, I love creating the content. Um, you know, I love photography. I love, I'm a very creative person. So I have a very distinct way of, of making my content and everything. So I love the, the process of making all these things, but to post it and then interact and then use social media. I mean, I don't think we can just, we could do a whole nother podcast about how annoying social media is, yeah. you know, but um, it's, it's really hard for me to balance it. And I think sometimes I, I figure it out and other times like a week and a half ago, I was like, mm, not really. I don't really know how I'm going to balance this. So on one hand, I really, I like social media because I like to make my content, right? I enjoy my content, but I, I also enjoy meeting people like you because me and you met in person years ago um, in our Charlotte yoga training, right? But like, I feel like we didn't really connect after that, unless like if, if it wasn't for social media, we might've not connected the way we did. So it's like, it's a great thing, social media in that way. Um, so I don't, I, I do see myself coming back at some point, but like, I'm not trying to set any hard rules of when I have to, it, it's really going to be when I feel like it. Um, and I, I hope that when I come back, I can, I can take the good things, you know, um, you know, like the, the kind of the, the kind of relationships I fostered and um, just making my art that I share with the world, you know, things like that. Um, and I hope I can, I can kind of get rid of the negative stuff and, it's, it's another form of healing, I think. I think social media tends to trigger me a lot um, because of what we were talking about earlier. You know, people have perfect pictures and seemingly perfect lives, and then I just feel really bad about myself, and I'm like, what am I doing wrong with my life, you know? Um, and now that I've been off social media for about a week and a half, I realize, like, I'm not really doing anything wrong, you know? I'm doing everything right. It's just, it's just a process. Um, and, you know, maybe there are other things that I, I could be doing to make my life better, but if I'm not doing them right now, I'll do them later. You know, I, I know I'm doing the work. Um, and so I want to be able to go back to social media with, uh, with that mindset strong, being strong mm -hmm. and prevalent. Mm. Do you feel like you have more space now without social space. media? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I don't think... I don't think scrolling through social media is like my problem. I think I'm, 
I've gotten pretty good at like limiting screen time, but I do find myself like, even like I find myself wanting to look at my phone less. Like before, um, so I have I have an app on my phone. So funny, I have an app on my phone that helps me with my phone less, isn't that? Isn't yeah. That crazy? <laughs> You've uh, got to work with what you have nowadays. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so no, and um, you know, it, it doesn't work for everybody, but it works pretty well for me. It pretty much like it. I set a time limit on how much time I'm allowed to spend on Instagram and YouTube. I, I don't think I go on Facebook or Twitter or anything else. I think those are the two main things. Um, and, you know, I set time limits for it. And if the time limit's up, then it's up. You know, I don't go on it until the next day. Um, but like, even like, even though it helps me go on it less, like my mind, like sometimes I still go to my phone, like as if I'm, I want to open the app again. You know what I mean? So that feeling from doing the doing this social media detox or whatever you call it, like that feeling has gone away. I'm not like reaching for my phone and that little, just, it seems so little, but it, it feels so freeing in my mind to not have to want to go on my phone to look at social media. Um, you know, if I have like actual like work tasks that I need to do on my phone, like talking to a coworker or setting up a meeting, um, cause phone meetings are all the rage these days. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> this is how uh, we meet like nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Things like that. I don't set a limit because, you know, I have to do them for work, but, um, another thing I, I, I do in my phone that I don't set a limit for, like, uh, I, I mean, I have, I have a actual like Kindle, but like the Kindle app on your, on your mobile phone, I use that, too. that one, I, I, when I'm looking for books, I love using the app on the phone because it's so much, uh, more like streamlined than using like, yeah. And, and then once I figure out, like, too. yeah, once I figure out what book I'm going to read, then I download it to my actual Kindle device and I read. Right. Um, yeah. so like those or like also like listening to music on my Spotify app, like those things, if I'm constantly reaching my phone to look at those things, I don't feel drained. I'm just like, I love reading books. I love listening to music. And, you know, I got to talk on the phone for my job. And, you know, I take a break from those things too, when I need to. But like when I reach for my phone to do those things, I don't feel as drained as when I look on my, when I go to my phone to look on social media. And I'm not, I can't pinpoint exactly why um, I feel that way. I just know that I do. And it's like, okay, if I like reading books and listening to music and whatever, then I'll use my phone for that. You know, like using, using technology, it doesn't have to be this bad, like, you know, those futuristic movies like Black Mirror and, and those yeah. shows, they're always like, technology is bad. And it's like, it's not real. it's not, technology is not bad. It's just, it's just, it's how you use it. Um, and I'm still figuring that out. So if anybody is listening right now and they want to reply to me with some tips on what they do, I would love to hear it because everybody's very different in how they, um, manage their time on their phone and social media. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that because I know it's one of, it's a hot topic nowadays because we're at home more and a lot of people, including myself, relationship with social media can be tricky if I do it mindlessly. I think we had a conversation about it, how, you know, I think we're, because it's the way it's designed is to make us go there all the time. And it trains our brain to unconsciously reach for your phone yeah, to check yeah, the no. things. That's exactly. So people who design um, social media apps, people who design, you know, actual like Android, like touchscreen phones, whether it's an iPhone or Android or whatever, um, even the way like streaming services are designed, like Hulu and Netflix, they're designed to make you addicted. You know, like when you're watching Netflix, I'm like, do you want to watch the next episode? And you're like, why are you asking me that dumb question? Of it's been five I hours. I, of course I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like, like just the physical act of, of swiping through things. Did you know that on Instagram and Facebook, the reason notifications are red is because that like, I forgot what the exact reason is, but there's like, they made it red on purpose. It wasn't like a random, like if they made notifications blue, we might be looking at our phones less. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Oh, yeah. so <laughs> this is exactly right. These these apps and these devices are engineered to make us feel addicted, which is is so sad to me because me and you are very much dabble in the health and wellness world, right? And there, we know so many people who care about mental health and physical health and nutritional health and all these different healths. But then we live in a world where there like there's an opposite industry almost that's like okay how can we make people feel bad about themselves yeah. yeah yeah well i was in advertising even though i went there 
because I wanted to work with charities to save the world. It didn't work out that, that way. But knowing their purpose of like, we want to get people to buy milk. We want to tap into their core desire feelings, whatever. I'm like, that's BS. Yeah, <laughs> I don't support yeah. any of that. Mm -hmm. But the world works like this. And I think sometimes, you know, either we fight it or we try to find a smarter way to beat it. <laughs> Not beat it, but like survive. Yeah, to yeah. I think, I think um, to say that, I think I actually do know quite a few not quite a few, but I know a few people who like don't go on social media, never been on social media. Um, and they always say like, they're so glad they didn't because they see what it does to other people. And it's, it's hard. I sometimes I feel like, you know, I should, maybe I should just be one of those people who never goes back on it ever again, you know? But I mean, when you're a food blogger, <laughs> I mean, I guess if I really wanted to, I could just run my website without Instagram, you know? Um, I, I think it is possible to do it. And, and I'm sure there are people who are very successful in doing that. But I mean, like I said, I'm still figuring it out. You know, yeah. um, like I, I love like creating my content. Experimenting too. Yeah, I love creating my content. And I love sharing it with people. Even if like, I love your content. <laughs> oh, thank you. I mean, like, even if I have one person who tells me like, oh, I really liked the, this, because I write a lot of personal things um, about myself. Um, and you know, a lot of those things you read and you asked about during this podcast, yeah. you know? So there you go. It's like a good thing, right? Because mm -hmm. someone, it reached somebody. Um, I've, I've gotten like a few messages ever since I really started putting myself out there with my blog and social media. I've gotten a few messages that are like, you know, I, I really appreciate like when you talk about yourself personally, it makes me realize that I'm not alone or um, even like more, like that's like really deep. I've, I've gotten things like, wow, I really like that recipe. Can you make more recipes like that? I'm like, yes, you know? Yeah. Um, or I, like all the yoga tips I post, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely gotten a lot of people that tell me, um, I really appreciate that you're not like a bendy, <laughs> handstandy kind of teacher, you know? And I'm like, you have no idea who, what it means to hear that because you get into the yoga world on Instagram, which I know you know about, um, <laughs> cause you're also a yoga guide. And it's just like these beautiful yoga teachers doing the most bendy things. And you're like, I can't do that. Am I allowed to teach, right? Yeah. yeah, I can do a handstand. I still can't. I play around because it's fun, but it doesn't define me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And social media, that's what it does to you. Like I did, I've been practicing yoga since I was 15. I, I think I started practicing it more uh, mindfully when I was um, 18. Mm -hmm. And I remember like up to then, like, up to there, I've never seen anyone do a crow pose, you know, because like I've just never been to a class where it was taught. And the first time I ever saw a teacher showing it, um, you know, she was, she was just having fun. She wasn't like forcing it. She was a really good teacher. So I appreciate it. But the first time I saw that, I was like, wow, like I didn't know like yoga had that, like the arm balance right. thing, you know? Yeah. And I, you know, it was just, that was all it was. Like I played around with it myself. Sometimes I did it. Sometimes I, did, I, I was able to do it. Sometimes I didn't, whatever. It was never a big deal. It was just like, oh, it was something that someone can do and maybe I'll be able to do it someday. And that, there's nothing wrong with that. But then... Like when I started, I think I started using Instagram like in my late into my college years. And I remember like there was this whole world of people doing like really advanced poses and quote unquote advanced poses. Yeah. And I remember thinking like at that point I already had, I haven't gotten any certifications or taught professionally in a studio, but like I remember like setting that goal already that I was going to. And then I started having all these doubts. I was like, wait, my daily practice doesn't include this kind of stuff. Should it, should I, should I perfect the handstand so I could be a good teacher one day? And it's like such a like young, naive way to think, you know? Um, but yeah, that, I mean, I don't have that mindset anymore. Um, and I think, I think Strala had a lot to do with that. But even before Strala, I was already feeling like uneasy. I was like, I don't like this handstand centered stuff. Yeah. You know, I want to find a tr training that lets me be how I want to be. Um, and yeah, and you know, following Tara for a while on social media, I was, um, I don't, I think I've been following her for years before I made the decision to take her, her training. Um, and once I did, I knew I made the right decision. Yes, very similar journeys to yours with yoga. Doing it because it felt good, but then also, I think it was also close to the years that Instagram kind of blew up with food recipe and yoga poses, and then it just became kind of like a creation for the yoga world of like 
super bendy circus people. <laughs> and then it just became kind of unattainable. And I've met people now, like thanks to Strala, I'm, I feel like I, I guide from a place where I'm more comfortable and I don't feel like an imposter. And when I meet people and they're like, I can't do any of this. I'm like, and I see them kind of doubting their themselves, even their sense of worth because they can't do something like this. When I'm like, all you need to do is sit and breathe with me. And I think a client I had, I she came with a lot of anxiety. She's like, somebody told me I should try it, so I might as well, but I can't do anything. And then I just got her breathing. And after a while, she was just like crying. She's like, I didn't know I could just feel good breathing. And yeah. I think we overcomplicate ourselves you know, circling back to adding rules to make us feel better, but then stressing out about it because we don't fit that expectation of our own rule. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, you've given me a lot to think about. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You've given me a lot to think about too. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, let's wrap it up with some rapid fire questions. Are okay. you ready? <laughs> What's the best compliment you've ever received? Oh, um, I would say off the top of my head, uh, a few years ago, I went to see my friend Florencia in Argentina and we were, uh, we went hiking, we did all these things. And then we were in the kitchen and um, I was teaching her how to make a recipe. And then I was looking out the window, I was like looking at the mountains. I was like, wow, I can't wait to go home and, and paint this. And she's like, wait, you paint? And I was like, yeah. And she just looked to me with like the most sincerest look. And she said, you're so multifaceted. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget that moment because she, I mean, she's a beautiful person and she loves to bring out the best in everybody. But when she said that to me, like, it was the first time I heard a compliment where I was like, you know, when you get a compliment and you're like, I don't like, why are you saying that about me? It's not true. Yeah. Cause you're just, you just feel so like bad about yourself. Like she said that to me and I'm like, yeah, I am. Thank you. <laughs> so that was to this day, that was, that was like four, maybe four or five years ago. I can't remember a while ago but yeah that was that was the best compliment i've ever received i hope she's listening to this <laughs> thank you for sharing i know we also had a conversation about compliments maybe for a follow-up podcast we can talk about it yeah <laughs> a book that's changed your life um oh okay uh, i want i'm gonna say marie kondo and the reason i i kind of hesitated there was because i know how popular <laughs> she is and i i really wish i could say a book that's not as popular so people would actually believe me, but I swear, like her book changed my life. Um, and I will say I read her book before she got popular on Netflix. <laughs> so there you go. Um, yeah, no, I love having a space where like my, my home is exactly, everything exactly where I want it to be. Um, going somewhere, going, going home to a place where, you know, it feels good, even if it's just like physical things it really manifests energy internally for you to figure out what you want to do with your life. And I know that sounds really far-fetched, but she explains it. She explains why and how to do so in her book. And um, all my friends know that she's like my, one of, one of my life heroes, heroine. So, yeah. yeah. Her book, um, the life changing magic of tidying up. Yeah. I've heard about it and watched enough of show, but I've never read the book. So I, I should probably add that to my list. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty short read. You'd probably get through it in a day, I think. Yeah. What does coming home mean to yourself? Um, well, just to go along with this conversation, um, giving myself permission to heal. Mm. I think for a long time, I, I thought um, I didn't need to heal because I didn't have trauma, but that was also because I didn't think I was worthy. I didn't think wor I was worthy of being happy. Um, and I'm really proud to say that I don't, I don't feel that way about myself anymore. So yeah, giving myself permission to heal, that's the best way to come home to myself. Oh, so beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. What would you like more of? Hmm. I would love to help more people in the world. Um, it's why I guide yoga. It's why I like cooking for people and developing recipes. Um, the feeling of gratitude I get when someone shows me gratitude after taking a class with me and feeling like good in their body um and then also the feeling like you ever like cook for a friend and they think your food is so good and they just look at you with like heart eye emoji. <laughs> I love that feeling I love when people like I love when people love to eat because food really brings people together and that's why I'm so passionate about it it's a love language I feel like <laughs> 
you know? So I'd like to make more people happy with my food and yoga and anything else that I can do to serve them. And I think you are right now, even with the content that you're sharing, your recipes, your yoga, like at least for me, I'm like, oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Any advice for your younger self? Yeah, stop being so damn hard on yourself. <laughs> That's my advice, okay? Just get out of your own head and stop being so hard on yourself. Um, I'm still very hard on myself, but less so in the process. Yeah. yeah. And even the way I said it, I'm being hard on myself. That was more, that was more to be funny, so. Yeah, there you go. it's a process. It is a process. <laughs> Where can people find you? So, uh, as you mentioned, I am on a social media <laughs> box, but my website is shukiyoga.com. Um, so my name is spelled S-H-U-K-I-E yoga.com. Um, my Instagram is the same handle. Um, and I also have a newsletter that uh, if you go to my website, you can subscribe to it. So um, I try to send out newsletters, um, you know, every month or so, but most of the time I, I usually just send them out when I have updates on what's going on my on my blog posts, with my recipes, with um, my public classes um, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So if you go on that website, you can pretty much find all my content, all um, my Instagram handle eventually when I do reactivate it. And yeah, subscribing to my newsletter. That's how people mm -hmm. can find me. Do you, are you offering any programs or classes right now? So I do teach um, a few public classes for my friend Ray at Root Yoga Wellness the Studio. Um, which is also on Instagram, so you can find her there. Um, but uh, mostly, especially now that, you know, people are staying home, I've been offering a lot of um, private sessions via Zoom. Um, I, I have several clients right now who actually really enjoy doing stuff, doing the classes on Zoom. I didn't think they would because yoga is such a personal, like you always do it in person in a studio. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I've gotten a lot of really good feedback um, because it's, you know, it's more flexible. You could do it from home and all that. So um, yeah, I offer, I offer, um, one-on-one -on -one sessions and, um, I really try to, I always have a phone call with a client beforehand to figure out what their goals are with the yoga practice. So every single session, private session that I do is, is a hundred percent tailored to what they want to work on. Um, and I think, I think for me, that's, that's my favorite way to guide is to get to know somebody. Amazing. I'll add all your information in the show notes so people can find you easier as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.